Visit Elmhurst.org to explore the new City of Elmhurst website. Find out the latest Elmhurst news, pay utility bills and parking tickets, report concerns, and much more. Elmhurst.org is an ideal way to discover what Elmhurst offers your business, your family, your life. Welcome, my name is Christina Gunther and I'm the Programs Coordinator here at the Elmhurst Historical Museum. Um, I hope before tonight's lecture you had a chance to visit our exhibit, Our Lives, Our Stories, America's Greatest Generation, which uses oral histories to tell the story of Americans born between 1910 and 1929, and it documents the Depression, World War II, and the boom of the 1950s. If you haven't seen it yet, time is running out. The exhibit closes on October 20th. And as a reminder, the museum is always free of charge and is open Tuesday through Sunday, 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. For tonight's talk, we are fortunate to have it taped for broadcast on Elmhurst, Our Kind of Town. It will air in November on Channel 6 um, on Comcast and AT&T U-verse Channel 99. So if you really like the talk, you can watch it again in November. Um, but for tonight's talk, let's get to the meat of it. Um, a College at War, American Women in World War II. We are very fortunate tonight to have Professor Catherine Forsland. She is the History Department Chair at Rockford University. She received her BA from the University of Illinois and her MA and PhD from Washington University in St. Louis. She co-authored We Are a College at War, which weaves together the World War II experiences of students and faculty at then Rockford College to provide readers with a better understanding of the role American women and college students played during this very significant period. And also join me in giving her a very warm Elmhurst welcome. I'm, I'm very honored to be part of the celebration here in Elmhurst, the part of the NEH uh, traveling program celebrating the greatest generation. That's my parents' generation, and so I've grown up hearing all about the Depression and World War II, not so much about the 50s, but um, I actually, well, I'm not sure I remember any of the 50s, but um, I, I certainly lived through some of them. So um, I know for my father, who passed away a few years ago, the war was the formative influence of his life. Uh, even near the end, um, with Alzheimer's and whatever, he could still remember the stories of his experiences in the Navy, crystal clear like they had just happened two minutes ago. But he might not have remembered his breakfast. So I think many of you might know people who have a very similar kind of experience to that. Now, Rockford College uh, was also a part of my life growing up because my mother uh, went there, uh, was a student from 1942, graduated with the class of 1946, and that institution had a tremendous influence on her life, and so I'm particularly honored on my parents' behalf to be a part of the celebration of The Greatest Generation. So a few words first about how our book came about. Uh, it started as an exploration of the leadership of the president of one of the presidents of Rockford College, Mary Ashby Cheek, who was president uh, from the late 30s uh, into the 50s. And also a connection between Cheek's leadership and the legacy of Jane Addams, who is our most famous uh, alum. I suspect many of you know her in connection with her work at Hull House in Chicago or through her work with the um, uh, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, Nobel Laureate, Nobel Peace Laureate, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And her, um, if you've read any of her work, uh, particularly 20 years at Hull House where she talks about going to Rockford College in, as she called it, humdrum Rockford. Um, she wanted to go to Smith, so by comparison I can see why <laughs> Rockford might have seen that way. Um, she also chronicled the influence that the institution of Rockford College had on her, and when one of my colleagues, uh, Christine Brunn, uh, started working on Cheek, 
uh, she really recognized that same kind of spirit that existed in Cheek's time as, as it had in Adam's time. And so interviews for that project with a number of alumni from the war years revealed a real treasure trove of information and materials uh, that could be used for a larger project. And another colleague, Mary Weeks Baxter uh, from Rockford, uh, recognized that and approached Chris about doing a bigger project. Uh, they really felt compelled to tell the story of the wartime college. I came in after they had already begun to work on it. They asked me to read the draft of one of the chapters. <clears throat> I suggested that, wow, they had a great story there, that the Rockford College women's experience really reflected the experience of women across the country. And then, of course, they said, oh, really? Um, maybe you could help us write that part of it. And so I became um, a co-author, and so here I am as a result. So I want to get started. So. Um, women's roles in World War II, from the battlefront to the home front, in factories, in USO clubs, Red Cross stations, military offices, coastal batteries, were exemplified by the activities of women students at Rockford College and other colleges across the country, by recent uh, Rockford uh, alumni, faculty, former faculty, former staff members, all of their contributions to the war effort were a perfect model for studying women during this time period. Now before the Pearl Harbor attack, students at Rockford College and across the country were as divided as the general population over how to respond to the looming and then expanding <coughs> war in Europe and Asia. Students joined a number of national student organizations and debated the various issues of the day, particularly to be involved or not to be involved in the war. And those of you that know the history know that the country struggled with um, all kinds of uh, neutrality legislation and neutrality policies trying to decide how to help the allies but stay out of the war, at least for a while. Um, for example, some students proposed in the uh, campus's regular compulsory chapel gathering um, that, that there be a telegram sent to President Roosevelt on behalf of the Jewish passengers of the ship St. Louis, which was seeking asylum uh, after being turned away from Cuba. And some of you may know the story of the St. Louis. Um, these students were, uh, I've got a quote here from one of them, they, they brought it up in the chapel uh, session saying we should send this telegram. Uh, they thought that of course everyone would agree but apparently that wasn't the case. Mary Ashby Cheek kind of suggested well let's, let's think about it rather than vote. Let's think about it and come back and so they talked about it, argued about it. When they came back, they voted um, almost unanimously to send the telegram. And so these were students who were very engaged in what was going on in the country. They wanted to be involved. They sent a number of telegrams to President Roosevelt. They actually even sent a, a telegram to um, Adolf Hitler. Uh, this is prior to Pearl Harbor and America's actual uh, involvement in the war. But um, one of the more interesting stories is that of um, <clears throat> a woman named Pauline Revere, or nicknamed Pauline Revere. Her name was Elaine Summers. She attended Rockford College in uh, 1942. She and others were concerned about passage of a proposed conscription law that they were sure was a first step uh, to American involvement in Europe's conflict. So Pauline decided that she was going to ride a horse across the country dressed as Paul Revere 
uh, to protest and bring attention to the conscription law and the concerns that, that they had about it. Um, she passed through small towns. In reality, she didn't ride the horse all the way there. She traveled by bus and in various towns she would you know, basically rent a horse, kind of ride around. She passed out lollipops with the slogan, don't be a sucker, lick conscription. <laughs> and uh, try to build uh, support uh, to oppose conscription. She, this is a photograph of her in Times Square in New York where she was greeted. Uh, one spectator, spectator there was not very um, supportive of her, of her mission, uh, calling her a Nazi. And uh, yet she continued to, um, on her journey, eventually ending up in Washington, D.C., and she presented an anti-conscription scroll, which was really a petition that had been signed by uh, a number of uh, students and others uh, to her congressman there in, an, in her effort to try and do something. But of course, like everyone else, after the Pearl Harbor bombing, the students backed the war and plunged headlong into the war effort. There was no questioning of uh, their support for the war effort once the war began, as is generally true throughout the country, women, men alike, obviously. Now overall, I would argue, and I think most historians would, uh, that it's hard to imagine the war effort of the United States succeeding as well as it did without the contributions of American women filling so many vital roles in the United States and overseas. All in addition to the suffering, uh, suffering the absence of one or more loved ones, which all women shared, whether it was a husband, a father, a brother, a friend, uh, all women shared that experience in some way or another. Um, you know, many people say if the war today was felt more widely like World War II was, that attitudes would be very different. And I'm not sure that I don't agree at least with that aspect of it. The Rockford College Archives has a letter uh, that was sent to campus later in the war uh, in early 1945, uh, sent by a Corporal Joel Archer who had seen a Detroit newspaper story that had been sent uh, to him and, and his buddies uh, that was about Rockford College and what college women were doing. And so he wrote a letter to the college, to the students, and he asked uh, essentially, what are you contributing to the war effort and to the eventual victory of the war? Uh, the archives does not have any recorded answer to that letter, but our book was aimed at, in essence, kind of trying to answer that letter. What were women doing to contribute to the war effort and to the victory? Now, one part of the answer was the uh, support system at home, on the home front, that was sustained by American women. Whether it was uh, women building military hardware and various kinds of supplies and equipment, uh, will, women flying supplies, ferrying and testing planes, women providing company and assistance and a taste of home in various camps and overseas through the USO and the Red Cross and other uh, institutions, women replacing men in offices, observation posts, base camps uh, in order to free them to go to the front and do fighting women studying and graduating with skills for military or other local service. In fact, you had to have a college degree to get into the WACs, uh, the Women's Army Corps. Uh, so it was, it was not, uh, it wasn't suited to everyone, certainly the military service wasn't, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, later. Now the support system uh, on the home front particularly included women helping servicemen preparing to go off to war. And here's a chart, a calendar uh, of various events. I know you can't kind of read all those things, but I suspect that you can see, you know, we've got bingo, we've got a quiz program, movies, square dancing, uh, more bingo, co-ed night, dancing, activities, variety, entertainment all at these various different USOs that existed in the Rockford area. 
The USO stands for the United Service Organizations. So there were a number of organizations that were part of the USO and did things all around Rockford and small and large cities and towns all across the country. So this is just gives you, you know, this is just one month, uh, one town, one city uh, of activities. All kinds of things that women from Rockford College and other women uh, planned and put on to help men, particularly in areas near military bases or other places where servicemen would have been present. Working at the USO was something that uh, many students at Rockford College did to support the war effort, but as this quote shows, it wasn't always fun and games. Uh, if I was a little better with my technology, I might have a little bit of Francis Langford or Joe Stafford playing in the background. Uh, some of you might, you know, those names might bring music to memory. But uh, the point here was that they were trying to entertain these soldiers. And most of the soldiers, the Rockford women, uh, Rockford College women encountered were recruits getting ready to go off to war. So they were, many of them very young, uh, many of them didn't have sufficient courage uh, to ask uh, any of the women to dance with them, uh, but they tried very hard uh, and felt that they were doing their part for the war effort. That was part of what mattered to them, is that they were doing something to help with the war. Um, women from Rockford College, uh, the Women's Glee Club from Rockford College visited uh, Great Lakes uh, Naval Hospital in 1943, uh, evidenced by this thank you letter uh, from the captain, the uh, medical officer in command. They went to the hospital there and uh, gave a concert for um, the soldiers who were uh, encamped there. But it wasn't all, of course, parties and punch. Um, women there had to keep the college going in times of shortages and rationing. Uh, the college had its own garden located off campus that helped produce food for the dining hall. Not all the food was produced there, but uh, as others had victory gardens to try and supplement what people had in their homes, uh, the college did the same thing. Now, Rockford College had a newspaper and it was originally called the Purple Parrot, purple and white are the college colors. And I want to read a little excerpt here from, uh, from the paper um, when they decided to change their name in October of 1943. In October 1943, the name of the paper was abruptly changed to the Vanguard. The editors of the paper explained their decision on the front page of the paper. And I quote here from the paper. Perhaps when the purple parrot first appeared, it was meant to be a parrot. We decided to say in the name of the paper what has been evident on each page of our newspaper for more than a few years. We've got a mind of our own. The student newspaper is not a bird which blurts forth occasional snatches of words that happen to be picked up from a passerby. It is actually an organized expression of imaginative and vital thought from ever developing minds, end quote. The decision to change the name pointed to the growing spirit and determination of these women to ensure that their voices be heard, as well as recognizing the increasing opportunities open to them. That same year, the Vanguard proclaimed, quote, we are a college at war, end quote stressing the significant role that students in colleges and universities played in the war effort and recognizing the sacrifices of soldiers. The editors of the paper argued, quote, the success of our military forces today in our fight to preserve a democratic way of life allows us to exist as a democratic liberal arts college. It is the primary purpose of this paper, therefore, to contribute in our fullest capacity toward conscious understanding of how we, as a college community, can achieve our maximum effectiveness in prosecuting the war. There was no question in the minds of these women that their efforts were equally important, obviously in a very different way, but equally important to the, um, <clears throat> to the war effort. 
And I've just got a couple pictures here uh, of the campus at that time. Um, you know, this is a, a bulletin, kind of a, I guess today they'd call it like a view book that gets sent out to prospective students, people looking uh, for information on the college. And I think this, I don't know if everybody can read it, in this issue, why college in a war-torn world? I mean, it, it kind of uh, echoes Corporal Archer's question. So you're living this cushy life at college while we're off at war. Well, you know, what are you doing? And here this is trying to answer the question of why college, uh, why college was important. Here's another, just for those of you interested perhaps, just kind of a shot of the, of the campus at the time. Now, the paper championed the war effort at home and abroad throughout the duration of the conflict. It highlighted metal scrap drives. This is a, a quote from, uh, from the paper uh, talking about that there were going to be uh, containers around campus. Uh, turn in your lipstick case. Some of you, I suspect, remember when lipstick cases were metal, not plastic like they are today, and uh, they tried to do metal scrap drives. Uh, it published ads um, that encouraged students, like other citizens, to help pay for the war. This is actually a, uh, oops, oops, that's not what I a savings bond um, ad but it's talking about, I mean, clearly this is representative of a Nazi soldier uh, closing a university. All you need to learn is to obey. Uh, this was, you know, don't let this happen here. Uh, you know, this was not an advertisement made by the college students, but made, um, pardon me, by the American government and published in the college newspaper. Uh, this one I found particularly interesting. We have a cartoon here for those of you maybe who can't read it. It says, Hal's crazy about me. He says I'm worth my weight in saving stamps. <laughs> right? And so, uh, you know, this was down here we have, you know, for victory, buy savings bonds and stamps, right? So uh, even the college theme and bonds were kind of linked, linked together. Um, this, uh, uh, you know, humor helped to sell, helped to sell war bonds, and <clears throat> in another way, had particular appeal uh, to women's students. Now, perhaps one of the most important roles of the Vanguard was that it shared the experiences of women from the World War II Rockford family back to the campus. Um, it reprinted many, many letters sent by former students, alumni, uh, staff, former staff and faculty members who had left the campus or who had, uh, who, who had moved on to other jobs or who left the campus to join the military. Stories from former students who lived in places like Germany and England uh, described the early war in Germany and what it was like there, but also described what the Blitz was like in London. And so students were reading firsthand accounts. Uh, you know, we sometimes, well, I don't know, I don't, maybe many of you in the audience don't, but I know my students in particular kind of forget what it was like before you could text or tweet and people had instant information. And so the fact that students had such ready access to uh, what historians, what we now refer to as primary sources, you know, direct information from people in the places where things were happening, was really pretty important for keeping them informed and keeping them engaged in what was going on around the world. Stories came back from the Red Cross and the various women's military branches, whether these were women stationed in the United States, stationed in Europe, stationed in Asia, they all brought the war closer to the students, encouraging them in their studies, encouraging them to keep contributing to the war effort in whatever way they could. Even, you know, toss in your empty lipstick case, however small it might be. Now, Rockford's uh, classes also addressed issues related to the war, like, for example, living within the requirements of the national rationing programs. So here we have a kind of home economics class where, I don't know if you can, how well you can see it down here, uh, official table of point values for various foods. And so they were learning to cook, but learning to cook within the framework of what was going on in the country. This is what 
women were were trying to do. Things were rationed, and you know you had points, and you used those to to uh, plan your meals. Now, one of possibly one of the most significant contributions made by Rockford College students and women all across the country, the region, certainly many women in the Chicagoland area was their work in America's factories. Once all the men are off fighting, who's going to run the factories to produce the war material that those men need and the allies needed to carry on the fight? In, um, <clears throat> in a 19, uh, November 7th, 1942 issue of the Chicago Tribune, uh, was an article titled Women in War Work. And this is one of the collages that was connected with it. Now clearly not all of these women are working. Somebody here, these women, I'll talk about this in a minute. But here we still have women studying. This is a particularly interesting photo, I think, because we have a woman with a microscope. Not the kind of image we normally think of for women in this time period. They were really trying to highlight that women at Rockford College and women in many colleges across the country were getting the same kind of education that men were that included hard science as well as literature, language, and all the other components of the liberal arts. Now this article went on to describe the nation's first quote, earn and learn program. And it highlighted work study students working at um, the Woodward Governor, now it's just known as uh, Woodward, and I snagged their logo off the web, so don't tell anybody. And for educational purposes, I think it fits within the fair use under the copyright law. But some of you may know this company. They, I know they have um, operations here in Chicago. They were uh, largely based out of Rockford. They still have a plant there, and they're actually getting ready to build a new one there. Um, so Rockford isn't as down and depressed economically, as some people we like to think. But Woodward Governor, now just Woodward Inc., uh, produced governors, which were essential to controlling the pitch of an airplane propeller. And these are very precise uh, instruments, uh, and they called for the delicate attention that women were believed to be better able to provide than male workers. And so here's uh, another shot of a woman doing, you know, very fine detail kind of work. Now, the reality is we know that women aren't necessarily better at this than men. Uh, some women might be, but some men might be. But that was the perception uh, of women, just like the first women who worked in factories in New England in the 1820s and 30s, uh, and working in textile mills where they had smaller hands, which generally they did, and they could get in and tie the broken threads and that sort of thing. So it was the same kind of idea here. Uh, the women in this program worked three days a week at Woodward's Rockford factory and attended class three days a week. And here I've got a quote out of the newspaper talking about, describing what these women did. They worked, uh, oh, I keep pushing the wrong one. They worked two shifts, so it's, you know, when an alarm clock down the corridor wakes you up, give a thought to that defense worker who's just coming in uh, and why they're getting up because they have to go to work. And when you see somebody walking wearily in Middle Hall, that was the main building on campus, uh, they've worked eight long hours uh, that day. So there was a lot of um, compassion among the students for those who were working. And this program was covered by national and city newspapers around the country, as well as certainly the Vanguard. Uh, it got Rockford College, earned Rockford College, a lot of attention across the country. It certainly was not the only program, but it, starting in November of 42, that was essentially about as quick as you could get something up and running between Pearl Harbor and the start of the next academic year. Uh, Pearl Harbor to January, don't really think anybody got that up, but Rockford jumped right in and got that program going. The women who participated uh, got the support of campus, as this clearly illustrates, and the work was often very tedious, but the patriotic contribution was recognized as well. Um, the Indianapolis Star wrote a story on the program that said, uh, quote, 
Earn as you learn is the new slogan at Rockford College. The college is not only meeting the challenge of the times, but is also satisfying the emotional need of young women whose patriotic urge is paramount. And so it's, you know, not just the college paper that's saying we want to participate. It's recognized everywhere. But rationing and working in factories wasn't the only way women contributed to the war effort. Many of them joined the nation's women's branches of armed services. Now, this is one uh, Rockford College alumna describing how it is that her family reacted to her interest. Um, this is pre uh, Pearl Harbor. She graduated before Pearl Harbor. And so for her, the opportunity was the Canadian Women's Air Force. Many women joined because of a deep desire to serve. They were inspired by the patriotism of many others, and they wanted to participate in what they recognized as a world-changing endeavor. Um, as one uh, Rockford College graduate explained in a 1944 story in The Vanguard. And I wanna, I wanna read another little quote here. Um, Um, after her, her commencement uh, ceremony, uh, at which she listened to Commander Mildred McAfee of the Waves, um, who was the former president of, um, here's some of the acronyms of the various women's branches of the service. Uh, she was also the former president of Wellesley College. Uh, this student felt that, quote, we were free in a world where there remained little freedom. And so that student, who was quoted in the, um, in the magazine, joined the SPARS, which was the um, Coast Guard's women's auxiliary branch. Another student, uh, Julia White Rogers, who graduated in 1943, uh, described why she joined up. And she joined the WAC after questioning her decision to go on to graduate school, even though she had a full fellowship to the University of Chicago. She explained why she enlisted in a letter written in 2006, and this was part of the research we did. Quote, after one quarter at the University of Chicago, I quit and joined the Women's Army Corps, WAC. The, the Navy, the WAVES, had much niftier uniforms, but they were not sent overseas, and I yearned to travel. I had just turned 22, and both my brothers, aged 20 and 18, were already in the Army Air Corps. Mama hung in her State Street window a small banner with three stars on it, one for each of her children serving. It was not easy for a child of the Depression to walk away from a fully paid master's degree scholarship, but she did. She eventually went back and did earn her master's degree, but she walked away from it. That's how powerful uh, she felt about it, and this is a picture of her. Um, another Rockford College graduate, uh, Marianne Saucier, who also graduated in 1943, produced a PowerPoint book of her life in, just recently. And it illustrates the power of her education during such a crucial time in our history and how it influenced the rest of her life, including her service in the wax. And here is a picture of her in her uniform. Uh, she finished up her basic training came back in early 1944 to visit the college and some of her friends, and uh, they snapped a picture of her uh, doing that. And this, this photo comes out of her um, PowerPoint, which is why it's got the nice border <laughs> on it. Um, Anne, uh, as she was known, uh, kept in touch with some of her Rockford College alumni friends during their war experience. And in this picture, uh, she's shown here with another fellow uh, Rockford uh, alumna, uh, Evelyn Turner, who is uh, over here on this side. Um, and they exchanged a lively correspondence and remained in touch for the rest of uh, their lives. Now, this is a picture of Evelyn Turner, and I, I, this, it's a lot of text, and I don't, I, I don't, I'm guessing you can read it, 
Um, it, it basically talks a little bit about her. If some of you uh, are familiar with uh, the Grays Lake area and the Turner Dime store that was there for years and years and years, uh, this, that was her family, and she went back after the war and ran the dime store. People in that part of the Chicago area uh, know that uh, institution. Apparently, it's right in downtown Grace Lake. Um, and um, Evie Turner did a really uh, good job of articulating, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the feeling of wax uh, and many in the services. And this is a description uh, about her life in the service that was published in the Alumna magazine uh, in 1944. She said, one of the first thrills as a whack was meeting up with a group of sailors who immediately started chanting the famous hymn, the wax and waves will win the war, so what the H blank blank are we fighting for? <laughs> that gave us a wonderful boost and we made the rest of the trip like veterans. And so they really felt um, encouraged by the support that a lot of the, the male service members uh, gave them as well. Now another alum, alumna, Dorothy Moyer, uh, she was in the Red Cross. She was a graduate, much earlier graduate, class of 31. She was an assistant field director for a Red Cross hospital in Calcutta, India. And she sent back to campus uh, an account of her time there, which was published in the 1945 alumni uh, bulletin. So I want to read a little bit just to kind of give you an idea of the kind of work that the Red Cross was doing uh, uh, around the world. Our cat, and this is a quote from her, our casualties are more from disease and fatigue than from Jap bullets. We've tried to build a recreation program to fill their time as they convalesce and take their minds off their homesickness. We have a hobby shop with all kinds of interesting arts and crafts. They make silver rings out of Indian rupees, paper knives and cigarette holders from salvaged airplane parts. We have active games for those who can take them, and we plan bingo and ward parties for those confined to bed. We have a good-sized library. Army Special Services helps us by providing movies and bringing traveling shows to the hospital. So all in all, our boys have a good many diversions before their return to duty or evacuation to the states, as the case may be. Our social workers make loans discuss personal and family problems with worried patients. We have a steady stream of patients coming into our offices daily, bringing problems big and small that may have existed before but never worried them so much till they got sick and had time to brood about them. So these people were doing not only medical but all kinds of social services really for soldiers far, far away from home. And these are all things that really, uh, you know, these, these Rockford College women uh, were doing, but other women were doing as well. As the war went on and eventually wound down, women from everywhere saw the end of the war on both the European and Asian fronts and shared those experiences with loved ones back in the States. Many accounts turned up in the RC, on the RC campus in the Vanguard and numerous other publications. And we have here uh, a picture of, uh, this is one of um, Anne Saucier's photos. She's right here in the middle. Uh, they're all assembling, getting ready uh, to ship home. Stories of triumph, uh, alumni who witnessed war crime trials both in Europe and in Asia, liberating American and foreign prisoners of war. Anne Saucier was one who was in the Philippines and uh, rec uh, helped uh, the, the nurses, that had, American nurses that had been there that were held as prisoners of war by the Japanese, uh, helped them convalesce and, and recuperate. Um, women were a part of all these activities. Now, we know about most of the activ these activities. We hear about them all the time in coverage of the war, but we don't always think of women being part of those activities, the war crime trials. Not a lot of women in those pictures, right? But there were women in the audience, women um, listening, women helping in the background. 
Now finally, I'd like to turn to another chapter of women's World War II experience. One of the chapters in our book focused on this topic that was prominent in the, in the minds of many women in spite of their wartime problems, and that was romance. And with Camp Grant just a few miles down the road, literally, uh, and it was one of the largest transit points for servicemen in the country, certainly for men coming in and being recruited. As the war progressed, uh, it turned uh, more into, I think it was the largest uh, training facility for medical personnel, army medical personnel in, uh, in the country. And so, of course, it was hard, hard for a women's college not to be closely attuned to Camp Grant and vice versa. Soldiers there had multiple opinions of the Rockford College students. Uh, many of these are little quotes that were taken out of uh, Vanguard uh, stories. Um, these soldiers came to campus, they came for teas, they came for dances, they came to pick up dates uh, and that sort of thing and so they were around quite a bit. Scores of young women across the country endured being left behind and accepting whatever fate sent their way. Courtships and marriages took on greater meaning and importance for both women and men, but as the ones left behind, women struggled with very different aspects of things. Um, women were, uh, you know, wartime stresses broke, some relationships for, for some women, Others survived and flourished despite the distance, despite the hardship on the home front, uh, as well as uh, being far away. For some, romance was a mechanism for survival. Letters were a key component in wartime romances. Some of you may uh, have heard or know of um, V-mail, which was aimed at uh, reducing the bulk of all the mail going back and forth uh, across the oceans. Uh, if you figure you got to send tanks and ammo and guns, but you also have to send mail, um, you know, pretty hard to make a choice between which to send. And if you can shrink the size of the mail, can't really shrink a tank. Uh, that was a that was a big um, um, uh, help to do that. It was microfilmed. Microfilm was sent to uh, across the ocean, and then letters were printed out from that microfilm and then delivered uh, to the soldiers. And, and we read a fair number of letters uh, that were exchanged between Rockford College uh, alumni and uh, brothers, husbands, uh, families, because some of the women wrote back to their families, so we have those letters as well. And it's interesting how so much of the letters was based on the pop culture of the time, the music or the, the movies that a soldier would write back and say, hey, they just showed you know, such and such film. What did, have you seen it? What did you think about it? And it provided a connection uh, between people. Songs and films were also safe topics of conversation in letters that were scrutinized by censors. You know, nobody was going to cut out your reference to the movie you saw or the lyrics in the latest uh, top 40 song, but you couldn't talk about where you were, or you couldn't even talk about whether or not things were going well, or if you were getting enough to eat, or whatever. That was verboten in that, uh, in that correspondence. Um, now students got their, getting their mail at the mail desk knew what was happening with their classmates as they gathered there uh, and that was a stage for many tears as students received news of family or sweethearts or even just friends who were missing or killed in action. And we have a lot of stories of those from the alumni talking about the day so-and-so got their letter, that someone was missing in action or whatever. And so you can imagine that the community of the college provided support for those women in a way that uh, some women just didn't have that support. They're, you know, they, they maybe lived with family. Many women did live with family uh, during the war, and um, the college really uh, kind of provided this, uh, this kind of uh, support for that. Um, <clears throat> many of the letters that were shared back and forth um, were sent with the expectation of 
raising the spirits, inspiring hope, and nurturing their recipients, no matter whether it was the soldier writing home or somebody on the home front writing to the soldier. That was clearly a motive in letters. And that's, of course, part of what the government told people to put in their letters. Write inspiring things. Write upbeat things. Don't write about how sad you are and how much you miss somebody. You know, you can say you miss somebody, but don't make it that the, the theme of it. But many letters also contain a sense of poignancy, a sense of fragility, and uncertainty about the future. There was no question that letters contained both of those uh, ranges of emotion, and, and that was really something that, that struck us. And those factors helped shape the post-war world when the men came home. Now, um, got another, this was one of the other things that uh, the um, students were really um, proud to do as part of the programming at the college, and that was to have dances. They were a major source of interna interaction between young women and the male military uh, population. Um, now, the college attempted to regulate student contact with soldiers. But there were servicemen everywhere in town. In fact, my mother, all whenever she talks about doing anything in Rockford during those years, she said everywhere you went, there were servicemen everywhere. And she was from Chicago. She came home for uh, vacations or in the summer, she said, same thing, servicemen everywhere in the country. And so it was not different in Rockford than it was anywhere else. Um, now, during the 1945, 1944 school year, students needed to have written parental permission to visit Camp Grant or attend a dance there. Uh, and they needed the permission of the dean to go to the officers club or the camp's USO or any other camp function. By that time, I think they felt there needed to be a little more regulation about the interaction between those two populations and so they tried to uh, to do that and the little student handbook for that year lists this this regulation and so we we found you know evidence of it as well as anecdotal stories about it there was also a great story about how one day students looked out the window and around the fence of the campus there were over a hundred students uh, students, soldiers standing around the fence peering in and they had been invited to campus as a joke but they didn't know it they all showed up there was quite a hubbub because there was a lot of a lot of soldiers to be on campus but President Mary Ashby Cheek allowed them to come in for tea and a stroll around the campus. And so they were certainly welcomed. And, and these kinds of interactions, of course, were important for the students, but more important were they also for, uh, for the soldiers. Now I have another, we have the dance card. Uh, some of you uh, may know, remember dance cards. I think they were kind of gone by the time I started going to dances. But that was another component of, of the dances. Now, one, um, one student uh, wrote, wrote or was quoted in the paper uh, being very excited about the freshman class. Uh, the fact that they had to come in fairly early seemed a little severe, but, you know, RC is wow, right? It's not hard to see that having that women's college so close to the camp was probably a big morale booster there. Pretty, pretty clear. Um, oh. Okay, one soldier was quoted in the paper as well. He wrote, he wrote back to a Rockford College student and his, his uh, letter was printed in the paper. At that time, he was a German POW when he wrote the letter back. And he was fondly remembering the dances at Rockford College. And he said, quote, dance one for me, as you always were an excellent dancer. And this memory was something that sustained him through his time in the POW camp. So we know that the dances meant something uh, to some of the soldiers. Now, the prevailing wisdom at the time discouraged hasty weddings with marriages to men departing for war. That was considered by many to be a bad idea. 
Census data indicates, however, there was a rising number of marriages during the war years. I don't think any of us are surprised, and many of which, many of those were to soldiers. We can't tell that from the census data, but there's really little question of that. And examples from the college run the gamut of couples' experiences during the war. Some married before uh, he was shipped out. Some got engaged but postponed marriage until the war was over. Some held off altogether, and some of those ended with Dear John or Dear Jane letters, which, of course, you know, we also know. Some women who got married followed their husbands around from camp to camp while they were trained and faced difficult housing shortages in the process. But overall, the wartime seemed to heighten the drama of everyday romance, adding separation, longing, worry, relief, and unimagined joy when it ended. Now, this was reprinted in the college paper, and it went with a story that talked about how this kind of a pinup, as the war was, was wearing on by 1945, this was becoming the favorite pinup uh, for soldiers uh, across, um, you know, overseas, rather than, you know, the usual ones we know of Betty Grable and all the, you know, shapely legs, this was becoming the new favorite and indicated really a very changing attitude as soldiers abroad, but also women at home, because this was also favored by a lot of people on the home front. They picked these things up free around town or they were inserts in the newspapers. Um, they really started dreaming about the day he comes home and what's that going to mean for our romance. Um, women who dated or married soldiers experienced the war that much more intensely because of the emotional connections that brought them even more directly into the wake of the war. Women's romantic roles provided a powerful incentive for men fighting abroad, giving them something to fight for, giving them more to fight for, and come home to at war's end. Women's contributions to their men through romance, through service at home, and through service in the military was certainly the answer to Corporal Archer's question of what women did to support the war. Thank you very much. Churchville Schoolhouse opens the door to the best education in history. Visitors to the Churchville Schoolhouse take a step back in time to watch history unfold in a restored National Register of Historic Places property that dates to the Civil War era. Students of today walk in the footsteps of local farm children from the early days of DuPage County for an authentic living history experience led by a school marm of the early 1900s. A visit to the Churchville Schoolhouse is hands-on, educational, and fun. Participants use slate chalkboards and McGuffey readers for the day's lessons. And children will be asked to follow proper classroom etiquette. Reading, writing, and arithmetic are practiced, and students test their skills during an old-fashioned spelling bee. And of course, no school day is complete without recess featuring games of the early 1900s. The schoolhouse is a popular place for scouts and day camps, too. Group visits can also be arranged for service clubs, tour groups, and other adult organizations. The Churchville Schoolhouse Living History Program is operated by the Elmhurst Historical Museum. Call the museum today to book a field trip or find out more information. 
call 630-833-1457 or visit our website at churchvilleschoolhouse.org. The Churchville Schoolhouse is waiting to open the doors for your school or community group. Plan a memorable learning experience today for the best education in history. Hi, I'm John Quigley, President and CEO of the Elmhurst Chamber of Commerce and Industry. In these challenging economic times, it's imperative that our residents and businesses band together to not only shop Elmhurst, but buy Elmhurst whenever possible. We have great stores in our city center, Spring Road, Butterfield Road, York and Vallette Streets, St. Charles and Route 83, North Avenue and Lake Street, along North York and even Grand Avenue. I ask for your help. Let's keep our tax dollars in Elmhurst.